The following is an educational program regarding transgender student athletes sponsored by the NCAA and conducted by Dr. Betsy Crane, a professor of education and director of graduate programs in human sexuality at Widener University. Dr. Crane brings expertise in both sexuality education as well as leadership studies. She is past president of the Foundation for the Scientific Study of Sexuality and co-editor of Sexual Lives, a reader on the theories and realities of human sexualities. Her research publications include The History of Gendered Sexuality and Shifting Gender and Sexual Identities of Young People. Thank you so much. Um, we're here to talk about an issue that uh, is one of the issues of diversity and pluralism in our society today, and one that people on campuses are facing as well as people in schools and universities, obviously, and corporations and organizations across the country. There's three keys to success when it comes to colleges and universities dealing well with the issue of transgender students and helping make sure students are successful academically as well as athletically, and that is uh, having an awareness of these issues, being prepared, and having policies that address the issues so that uh, they can be prepared when issues arise. As I said, I think this is an issue of gender awareness and diversity. Um, we know that increasing numbers of students, parents, alumni, faculty, staff, and others identify as transgender. Um, that this is a multicultural issue. It's not just an issue happening in the United States. And I thought it's interesting if you don't know already that in India, for instance, just this last year, um, they agreed to have a third gender on registration for voting so that people can register it with an O. Um, there's, uh, there's been third genders in cultures historically and around the world. Um, they just haven't been recognized over these last, uh, I would say, you know, 10,000 years of sort of um, patriarchal gender diversity where there were very clear roles for men and for women and you had to occupy one or the other. And as this is starting to soften around the world in some ways, um, I think what we're going to see is more diversity in many more countries as well. This history is also in our own land. Uh, Native Americans had a two-spirit uh, tradition, and it was often actually the people who anthropologists came to call them Burdash, um, that if a child was orphaned and needed uh, parenting, the child would be given to someone who was Burdash because it was seen that that person had the spirit of both the male and the female and had the wisdom and the knowledge of both the male and the female, so therefore would be the best parents that a child could get. Um, just as a, a case example at Widener, um, which is how uh, my interest in this came to Dr. Harris's attention, we had a uh, student athlete uh, last year who was uh, a transgender female who was wanting to play on the women's lacrosse team. And uh, I think it went very well in terms of preparation. Dr. Harris brought me in to talk to the senior staff. Uh, about these issues, a presentation in some ways similar to what I'm doing here today. Um, and we decided to do, uh, I got together with the lacrosse coaches and also the co-captains. I thought the co-captains would be very, very important in terms of preparing the team to function well um, and be prepared uh, to work well with this athlete. The co-captains were fabulous. And it was there that issues came up, for instance, about what are we going to do when they're on, on the road? How are we going to handle locker rooms? One of the co-captains said, just have a room with me. It's not a problem. And so we got issues out on the table that maybe some of the team members might um, have concerns about. After that, the coach said uh, she was going to bring me in to talk to the team. It was the night before fall practice was starting. Um, the individual was very open, in her case, about uh, being willing to share who she was and what her journey had been. She had been an Iraq soldier as a man and had transitioned um, as, as a transsexual, taking hormones and transitioning her body um, before coming back to Widener. And she talked with the, the student athletes. Uh, she played with them during the fall. We thought we were pretty ready. As it turned out, she didn't continue um, to uh, want to play on the team in the spring, but it was more of an academic issue than an athletic issue. But that gave us that experience of saying, hey, you know, this could happen uh, at any campus. And I think the point is to be prepared and to be able to prepare to have those conversations. Um, this is happening outside of uh, the NCA, obviously. Um, recent example was a transgender golfer was suing the uh, LT LPGA for the right to compete. So I think we're going to see this at the, both the professional level and at the, uh, the college level. 
colleges are facing issues around transgender and transgender students in many different ways, not just athletics. Um, there is the, has been the issue, and these were just a few articles that I pulled up of uh, campuses, University of Pennsylvania, dealing with an issue of gender neutral housing. How are they going to handle housing? Um, the issue of toilets, it's actually uh, a big issue. Uh, I know what we've done at Widener is taken some of the single stall uh, uh, handicap rooms and just labeled them gender neutral. Uh, but if you're uh, someone whose gender presentation is variant in a way that makes it uncomfortable for you to go in a women's room or a man's room because you might be questioned as to why you're there, it can be a real issue of how far you have to walk from class to go someplace where you can actually go to the bathroom. This is not a small issue. Um, safety issues are big. Um, even though we're, of course, working very, very hard to make sure that there is acceptance and things go smoothly, um, this is a population that has faced, and, and on a daily basis, faces a great deal of harassment, sometimes violence. And campus safety needs to be aware of that as well, as well as university um, uh, administration officials. And then there's the question of university support services, whether it's the Counseling Center, the Health Center, Interface Center, any of the uh, campus organizations. How do we integrate people who may, again, not fit in that male or female um, box? This is an example that was highlighted in the white paper that you have access to the, on the team paper, uh, which you may be familiar with. Keelan Godsey, uh, NCAA uh, champion hammer thrower and All-American honors in hammer weight and discus. Uh, was at Bates College and on the women team, um, although Keelan now identifies as a man. But from the time he was a freshman and the interview that's in the paper, he said he uh, had uh, wanted to achieve athletic success but also really wanted to transition from being a woman to a man. So obviously was in that position of having those inner feelings of the gender that I'm presenting at is not the real me. And I'm not really able to uh, be comfortable presenting in the gender that I am, that I've been assigned and have been trying to live. Uh, but he was terrified about transitioning or coming out, um, in part because of fear of letting down the team. But during his senior year, he started identifying as a man, uh, changing his first name, uh, which used to be a woman's name, started having his teammates and others refer to him with, as male, with male pronouns. And pronouns actually are a big issue. Um, being willing and able to accept and use the pronouns that are preferred by the individual. Um, he took no gender transition hormone medications, nor did he have any surgery, so he continued to play and win for the women's team. So this was someone who presented as male playing on the women's team. At Bates, the coaches, faculty members, team members were very supportive, and he said uh, when he started the process, um, but before that he didn't know how he would be treated. So I think that's the situation. Uh, University officials might say, well, how many students do we have that we're going to have to deal with this with? And the answer is always we don't know. Because if people are afraid, if people don't know how they'll be treated, um, they're going to stay in, in a closet, so to speak, um, around the gender issue. So it, uh, why should we want to prepare and why should we prepare as sort of a moral and ethical issue as well as a social justice issue? Um, I think that uh, the reality is that more children and youth are uh, being allowed to live their lives more in alignment with what they feel is their true gender. Certainly uh, schools, public and private schools, are dealing with parents who have children who boys that want to wear dresses and feel that they are more comfortable living as females. Schools are dealing with this. This means that as they come to college, you're going to have more people that have been living in another gender throughout their childhood and adolescence. Adolescence is when the medical issues start to go in because if someone wants to transition, sometimes there are hormone blockers used to delay puberty um, so that that person can get a little older and have more age and developmental knowledge before they have to make that decision. But those are issues that parents and schools and physicians are dealing with. Um, many of these students, as well as students who start during their college years to realize that the gender um, that they've been assigned is not one that feels like their real gender, um, they want to you know, enjoy athletics and they want to be part of a sports team. Um, students uh, who are gender variant uh, may face bullying, isolation, and I think denying them the ability to play on a sports team just reinforces that status as that they're an outsider, they don't quite fit in, so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Additionally, college and universities' diversity mission statements increasingly inc include the term gender identity or gender expression as one of the uh, areas of diversity that the universities are supporting. 
And then finally, states, localities, and schools are adding gender identity and expression to non-discrimination policies. So you've got some legal and political issues about not discriminating. It's also, I think, a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for the NCAA in terms of leadership. Um, given your commitment to the student athlete, um, the core values of equal opportunity, inclusion, and safety, um, that we know that athletic participation can promote students' physical, social, emotional well-being. Um, for some, uh, participation in sports leads to careers in the field. Maybe that's true for some of you uh, watching this or being here today. Opportunities to teach all students about citizenship in a gender diverse world and having respectful interactions. I know when I spoke with the women's lacrosse team at Widener, one of the things I said is that you're having an opportunity here to have to take leadership. And when you're out in the world work world, you're going to work with people who are gender diverse. And not everybody gets to experience this here in college. How lucky you are. And take that as a really positive experience. So what do we need to be successful? Basically, awareness, leaders, coaches, faculty, staff, students, parents, alumni, media relations staff, um, that there will be, preferably, and, and soon with uh, uh, nationally uh, uniform policies so that one team isn't making decisions that are different than another team or school. And then preparation is key, that athletic pro uh, programs deal with issues like the basic accommodations, the pronouns, the dress codes, bathrooms, changing areas, hotel rooms, and other policies like confidential no notification of competing teams. So to begin on that awareness, I just want to walk us through some key concepts that I think are important to understand as we see them in the field of human sexuality and certainly psychology, sociology. Um, increasingly, we're looking at the term sex and gender differently, where the word sex is really about being Typically, we would think of the binary of being male or female. Every baby that gets born, the first question everybody asks, well, now we ask it after the first sonogram or third sonogram or something. But the first question is, is it a boy or a girl? Um, and yet we know that there are perhaps one out of every 2,000 births of people who are born intersexual, who for chromosomal um, reasons uh, or physical reasons, just in the way their genitals appear, it isn't completely clear if they're male or female. And we've kind of kept this uh, under the carpet, so to speak. Typically, if a, little, if a baby is born with what looks like a large clitoris, it's made small and made into a girl, because that's easier to do than the other direction. Um, but there are people, and sometimes people have never even been told that they were born with, genital, with ambiguous genitalia. And so that's a population for whom gender um, may not quite fit the binary. But everybody pretty much at birth gets assigned a gender. So depending on your body, you get said, okay, that's a boy or that's a girl. And we, we look at gender as really being a cultural socialization issue. That depending on where you grow up and what subculture you're in, your religion, your geography, or um, your nationality, what it means to be a boy and what it means to be a girl is very different. Would you agree that, you know, as we look at males and females, we know depending on what culture they, they were born up, they were raised in, they're going to appear differently at times. And so we call that gender. And we know that that is what is changing. Certainly there have been huge changes for women in terms of the gender expectations that have occurred over the last 40 years. And increasingly there are changes for males as well as men. We also have this other gender now that we're talking about as trans. And trans is more of the heart and the mind. How do people feel about their own gender and the gender that they identify with? So gender identity is this inner psychological concept of self as male, female. Um, and it most likely occurs for people between the ages of 18 months and three years that people start to come into a sense of whether they feel like a boy or a girl. We often don't listen to that with children because that's just who they are and we tell them that's who they have to be. And if, you know, little boys especially have been, you know, don't wear girls clothes and don't wear, don't, don't dress, you know, um, don't play with dolls, just play with boy things. I think that's sort of a repression for some people of a gender that never did feel quite right to them that may come out later. The term gender expression is just that, how we express our gender. Um, the theorist Judith Butler would call it gender performance, that gender is something that we perform. We, we do things every day that we don't think about, the way we dress, the way we appear, to appear as our gender, uh, we perform it. Um, and our sexual or 
orientation is completely different from all of this, and I think that's really important to note. That sex orientation is about who we're attracted to romantically, sexually, um, erotically, um, typically seen as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or some young people are now using the term heteroflexible. So there are, you know, just like in the gender world, there are people who are not really wanting to identify with one <laughs> orientation or another. They're saying I'm attracted to people I'm attracted to. Um, and then there's the Kinsey scale of zero to six, where exclusively heterosexual to exclusively uh, homosexual, with people having fantasies, experiences, behaviors someplace in the middle. But that's a separate issue. So the transgender term, transgender increasingly we're seeing it as an umbrella term for a lot of different ways of being where someone doesn't fit the, the stereotypical gender norms. So uh, this can include uh, those or those who more narrowly really want to change their gender identity from the one they were born with. And I think there's sort of two different populations as we go through this to help you think about that. There are people who are, for instance, uh, born male, feel that their true sexual identity is to be a woman, and go through hormonal and physical surgery to become a woman. And most typically, we would refer to them as transsexuals. They've done a complete sex reassignment process. There are other people who won't do that and don't really want to, um, some who can't afford to because it's not inexpensive, um, who will make other kinds of transitions in their gender in the way they appear or by taking hormones, but may never have surgery. So all of these folks are included in what we think of as, as transgender. We also hear terms gender non-conforming or gender variant. And these are, this is someone whose behaviors or interests fall out of what is stereotypically assigned for their gender. Uh, they're not necessarily transgender. So these are just people who play with, possibly, or just feel more comfortable expressing a gender that's not exactly what they were assigned to be. Um, I had a student at a previous university where I worked. He was about 6'2", had a beard, um, very male, uh, heterosexual, and he always wore skirts and high boots. Um, on campus. And this is a Western Pennsylvania University, not the most progressive necessarily in terms of some of the gender issues. And when he was taking my sexuality class, one of the other guys said, dude, why do you do this to yourself? You know, you're setting yourself up, you're always getting harassed. And he just said in the most sincere of all possible ways, he said, no, you don't understand. When I dress as a traditional guy, I am so uncomfortable. Like if I had to take a test dressed like a tr traditional male, I wouldn't do very well. This is who I am, this is who I feel like I am. And we all just sort of sat there and listened because that was such an important story to hear. So it's not like people are doing it just to act out or to be difficult. This is, this is a very dear thing within his heart. The term gender fluidity refers to people with a flexible range of behaviors. And this is where you know, people might say, I don't care what you are, just decide. <laughs> you know, what is it, you're this, this day, that, that day, you know, because maybe another day he might dress somewhat differently. But you know what the story is, we're in a democratic country and people get to be who they want to be. Uh, it's not up, up to us to decide how they should be. Our only, I think, response is how do we feel that they should be treated? And should they be treated with equality and opportunity? Gender queer refers to blurring lines around gender orientation and sexual orientation, gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, this is a term that's used for people uh, by people who just want to reject all the categories. They say, eh, you know, I don't want to be put in a box. I'm gender queer. You figure me out. I don't care. So, transgender and intersex. Uh, I've heard to this a little bit before, but the transgender term refers to people with psychological and social identification as a man or woman that differs from their sex at birth. So this is something where they've psychologically or socially made that transition. People with intersex conditions or differences of sex development are born with physically mixed or atypical bodies related to their sexual genital characteristics. And this is not always visible. People don't even always know until later in their lives. They're not menstruating when they're coming into puberty if they're assigned as female. Um, they're infertile if they're male. And they never knew they were intersex. But I think it's just a, a, something that deserves to be talked about we need to know more about. So I want to talk a little bit about this process of transitioning, because hopefully as you're getting, just based on all the different ways that people may be around their gender, there's also a lot of different ways that people transition. So uh, social transition is probably the one that campuses and college student athletes are most 
frequently going to be uh, dealing with. These are people who aren't taking hormones, aren't suppressing hormones, aren't changing their bodies physically, but they are presenting as a gender different than the sex that they were born with. So recently at George Washington, uh, a woman's basketball player um, transitioned to male in the way uh, that he, because he then wanted to be referred to as he, was more comfortable presenting. And apparently George Washington did a really wonderful job in terms of preparation on campus, preparing the media, preparing the other teams. And he was able to make that transition without a real problem. Um, and I think that campuses may see more situations like that. Social transition. Hormonal transition takes place when people say, oh, I, I really, really don't want to be anymore in the, the body that I have and the way that I appear. So for a, a female to start taking testosterone, for instance, um, that person can, you know, as, we, as, as people have seen um, in videos, people can transition their looks dramatically, um, have beards, have more musculature, um, and appear very male to the point where you wouldn't know that that person had ever been female. Um, in a community where I lived recently, there was a couple um, that appeared, they were members of our church, they appeared to be a traditional heterosexual couple with two teenage daughters, and I found out as we got closer to them that Alex had pre previously been Sandy. They had been a lesbian couple when they lived in Rochester, New York, another community. Um, Sandy had taken testosterone, completely transitioned um, his body hormonally, had never had surgery, um, but nobody would know that. Eventually, actually, uh, uh, Alex worked as a bus driver for the school district and wanted to have breast removal surgery, but he told his uh, supervisor he was going for prostate surgery, which I thought was sort of interesting. <laughs> um, but most people in the community would never have known that they weren't a heterosexual married couple that they previously that he'd been female. Again, hormones only, um, no genital surgery. So that's the hormonal transition, and again, that's what we're dealing with in terms of colleges having to make policy decisions on who gets to play on what team once hormones start to become part of the issue. Surgical transition does have to do with body modification, so removing breasts, changing genitals, making a vagina, making a penis. Um, this is uh, obviously much more uh, um, serious, it's expensive. Um, the Netherlands pays for it, some other countries pay for it, but we don't in the United States unless uh, you have the resources. Probably not going to happen during the four years people are at college very often, although you may have people who had previously surgically transitioned, like the athlete that we were talking about at Widener. So what are we uh, talking about around awareness of support for all students who are trans or transgender? The safety is huge. Um, universities obviously have a commitment to students that they're safe. And this has to do with roommates and bathrooms, locker rooms, facilities. But there's also issues like forms and databases. If somebody's not comfortable being in the M or F slot, is there another possibility? And I know some campuses are starting to adopt O or having another um, sex category. Healthcare providers, counseling, referrals, if someone uh, is interested in transitioning, where do they get that? Medical support, programming, advising, support, uh, having transgender speakers, uh, artists, performance on campus so that all the student body and faculty and staff can start to become more comfortable with this as a part of the gender diversity um, that's happening in the world. Gendered spaces on campus. There's not just athletic teams that are gendered. There are other uh, student groups that you're on if you're a male or if you're a female. And these groups will be needing to deal with this issue as well. So whether it's music programs, dorms, Greek, Greek societies, and obviously athletic teams. And then the overall campus climate. Um, campuses, I think, are increasingly dealing with homophobia in terms of concerns about sexual orientation, but transphobia is another whole concept altogether. People might say, oh, I'm all right, I get it that some people you know, are gay or lesbian, but why do people have to change their sex? This is just too confusing. So this just becomes another thing that we have to say, OK, let's learn, let's become educated, and uh, let's work on this. So in terms of policies, basically policies help us because they're the guiding principles. And if everyone knows what the policy is and you follow the policy, it makes everything a lot easier. So we want to have, uh, we want to go with the guiding principles of equal opportunity and inclusion. Uh, there is a concern about preserving the integrity of women's sports. We want to use sound medical and scientific knowledge. <coughs> 
that we want to have policies that are practical, fair, available, and able to be enforced. And I think that's always the issue, that you get into issues of inequality when you don't have policies that are enforced across the board. You want to have a clear appeals process so that if someone feels that they haven't been treated well in terms of decisions that have been made, where can they go? Privacy is important. There's all sorts of privacy issues with student medical records, students' academic records. This is another one um, that we're not going to just be talking about unless the student, for instance, in the case I was talking about, the student was willing to be identified as transgender to her team. Um, privacy issues need to be negotiated. Access to educational resources and training is going to be huge. And then compliance. So there, there are state, federal, even local laws about non discrimination. People need to be aware of those. So at the eligibility policies are, are the big issue for athletic teams. So who gets to play on what team and what does that mean? So the International Olympic Committee um, is looking at that level of athletics. Um, they took the position in, 19, in 2004 of uh, requiring genital reconstruction surgery. They weren't going to let somebody play on a different sports team in terms of their sex unless they completely transitioned, not just hormonally, but physically. Um, however, um, there's really no sound medical basis for this. What your genitals look like or what, whether you have breasts doesn't affect your athletic performance. So that the NCAA and the groups that have been studying this are not really going to look at genital reconstruction as uh, any kind of an eligibility requirement. And this white paper that we've been using uh, recommends that eligibility be based on hormone use only. So we're also concerned about competitive equity. Uh, we want to make sure that um, people paying on the teams have an equal chance of doing well. Um, and I think initially we just need to recognize that, you know, there are differences on teams anyway, even not looking at this transgender issues. Bodies come in all kinds of ways. There's women that play on basketball teams that are short and some that are tall. There are football players that are big and, big and bulky and some that aren't. And they have different kinds of skills, right? Some of them are faster runners, some of them are better interceptors. And I think we need to recognize that lots of people's bodies look different. So if you end up on having a, a, an F to M transition, a female to male transition, and this person's shorter than the other people, well, they're short people anyway. So let's just recognize that there is a diversity in bodies. For the male to female, uh, transgender girls and women, uh, testosterone blockers and estrogen really minimize the differences. So once somebody is having their testosterone blocked and taking estrogen, as this the cross player I keep referring to said, um, she said that now she's taking estrogen, she has a lot more empathy for what girls and women have always gone through around hormone, you know, just emotional kind of responses to things. Um, and uh, so that reduces the problem with competitive equity. Um, and what else? People have said, well, are, are male students going to pretend to be transgender in order to compete on a female team? Um, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, just the, the concern about any stigma re, uh, related to it and then having to take a testosterone blocker and take estrogen. No, I don't think you're going to see a lot of people going there. So this is, this is really going to be something that we're dealing with with people who are really sincere. That this is a major change they're willing to make in their lives, in their bodies, um, and they deserve that support. So I think that one of the most important things is the decision from the top. That the university college or president, administration, the director of the athletic uh, program at the university or college says we're going to support transgender students and transgender athletes. That's the bottom line and we're going to take every step that's necessary to make sure that that occurs. That this is reflected in a non-discrimination policy and procedure as well as in diversity mission statements for the university or college. That there is information, education, training for key staff, collaborative engagement with the faculty and with student organizations, because the students need to be prepared as well. And then that there's support for the athletic division leaders and coaches to prepare themselves mentally, emotionally, and physically. I know for this lacrosse coach that I was assisting, she was like, okay, here we go. You know, this wasn't, didn't know this is what I was going to be doing this semester. So thanks for being here. Thanks for the support. I know I called her every week. How are things going? Um, and she really appreciated that. And then clear statements to students, teams, the media as needed. That this is a, an equity issue, that it's about uh, supporting students and being very clear. So the education for all members of the school, of the school community about non-discrimination, about use of preferred pronouns and names, expectations for respectful team and school climate, that athletic personnel uh, need to know about the policies for the basic accommodations that we talked about earlier, 
Um, that opposing teams are also prepared so that it's generally recommended that a team who has a transgender athlete lets the other team know. Um, they protect the identity of that athlete, but still make plans for any accommodations that have to be made and that they don't out that person. So media planning and training, obviously very important. That all school athletic representatives authorized to speak with the media need information about the use of preferred names and pronouns, the school and athletic conference policies, school diversity mission, and key talking points as any time that they would be talking to the media. And again, this confidentiality, protecting the privacy and dignity of the athlete is the top priority. And all medical information remaining confidential. It's also important to have non-retaliation so that there is clear enforcement and the violations of policies related to inclusion of transgender athletes um, are uh, on the basis of gender identity, uh, must be subject to disciplinary action, and that if there is any retaliation, um, that someone has some place to go to get support and help with that. So um, finally, and this is my last point and last slide, um, I think it's both a challenge and an opportunity that having uh, transgender students on campus and transgender athletes on teams does provide an opportunity to demonstrate principles of equal opportunity and valuing diversity. Um, as uh, Jennifer Hartstrom at Bates College said, who had the athlete I spoke about earlier, I think it's important for us to be aware that there's transgender student athletes who want to compete and with a little preparation, including transgender athletes, isn't a big deal. So whether it's a big deal or not, I think it's an opportunity uh, to advance our preparation and our students' preparation for citizenship in an increasingly diverse society. So thank you very much. So we wanted to have an opportunity for some discussion. And we have a microphone so that everybody can hear. And, um, but before we do that, actually, I'm going to give you a chance to talk to somebody sitting next to you. So can you just pair up at either twos or threes? Maybe twos, because the twos work better. Can you do that? And just find twos. Find somebody sitting next to you. What are your thoughts, feelings, responses to all of this material? Take a few minutes. So first thoughts, questions. What did you talk about? Just to kind of get a buzz going in the room. Yeah. Well, we kind of brought up the, oh, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you so much. Well, we kind of brought up the, the issue of NCAA championships and mixed gender teams have a certain designation. I, I believe it's they'd be precluded from competing in an NCAA championship. At, you know, at the risk of sounding insensitive, could you comment on maybe the balancing of interests of the 12, 15, 18 other people on the roster who wouldn't have this opportunity to participate in an NCAA championship when you allow an individual to compete and then classify the team as mixed gender? Okay. I'm actually going to turn to Mary and Karen for that one because uh, I think we need, we need an internal response here. You raise a really good question and I think that's something that our um, um, membership group is looking, looking at. How, what would the impact be on mixed team participation? So. That team that is, let's say, a women's team that has someone who was born male and is transitioning and has um, taken the chance to participate on the women's team, turns it into a mixed team, they would be eligible for the men's championship, but they wouldn't be eligible for the women's championship. If that person was transitioning and had done that year of hormonal treatment, then that women's team would be eligible for the women's championship. So there's still the possibility that with um, the right protocol and eliminating some of the, the competitive inequity concerns, that that team would not be impacted. I think every institution is going to have to talk about that, that there is an impact on the other students who are participating and um, whether they need to maybe go through that year of transition or not or, or consider whether that um, person should be competing on the men's team rather than turning that into a mixed team. But I think that will be an individual decision for that student athlete for those teams. I think that's a really good point. I think when you, uh, hopefully as is clear from what we talked about already, for people who are doing a social transition not taking hormones, the impact is not going to be different. It's really just learning to accommodate to the fact that you're going to have somebody on your team who looks and presents differently than the other people on the team. That's all we're really dealing with. Maybe some issues around uniforms, how people dress, people are going to deal with that. I also think it's not going to be an issue where people have already transitioned. It's going to be that during that transitioning year. 
And, and I think that a lot of your top athletes may in fact do what Karen's referring to, just wait um, and transition afterwards. Other comments, questions, thoughts, feelings, responses? What'd you talk about? What'd you folks talk about? Okay. I know you talked because I heard you. <laughs> yeah, all right, fair. I just want to raise the uh, the issue about the because this is something that the membership will be watching about um, the waiver process for uh, use of testosterone and sort of um, a comment that we, we currently allow uh, medical exception for testosterone treatment um, if we have a male student athlete whose body is not fully functioning is not producing enough testosterone they can get an exception to our banned drug policy and be prescribed with enough medical documentation testosterone. So, so the Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sports has looked at this issue uh, in terms of a transgender student athlete who may be seeking treatment with testosterone. So you've got a female to male, so a, a female, a born female who is transitioning to male who wants to use uh, medication testosterone and that that would be considered appropriate treatment. Uh, it is uh, already considered appropriate appropriate treatment by the American Medical Association, American Psychological Association. And so we, we sort of have the precedence already for that. Um, again, of course, the, the issue will be then when and where does that student athlete participate. And um, I think that um, one of the, uh, the things that we've done is talk a lot with the experts in the field that work with the IOC policy and others and, and recognize and acknowledge that once a, uh, a, a trans male, so born female, transitioning to male, starts taking testosterone, that student athlete would no longer compete on the women's team without changing the nature of the women's team. So, um, and that will be one of the challenges, I think, for the membership, um, especially if we have uh, uh, women's colleges, where there's not an opportunity to move over to a men's team in that case. So, uh, having said that, I also just wanted to ask, um, when you had your experience at Widener with uh, your lacrosse team, was there anything um, through that experience that, uh, that you can share with us that maybe wasn't handled as well or you wouldn't handle it the same way now in retrospect that would be a learning opportunity for the rest of us, a, a, an obstacle or a challenge you should uh, give uh, the rest of the membership to help them avoid something that they shouldn't do, I guess? Um, actually, there isn't. Uh, I think that it was handled well right from the very beginning. And I think it again was leadership from the top that um, immediately as soon as President Harris knew that this was going to be the case, he called me. He just happened to have somebody on campus with sexuality knowledge, but that would be true in most campuses, or could be. Um, that, that bringing together the senior management team and everyone that would be involved I thought was key, having the university relations staff there. Because one of their big concerns was, okay, this is going to be on the Today Show, and we need to be ready and we want to make sure that we've got our ducks lined up in a row. But I think the other thing that they did so well was that the concern was always on the student. And we want the student's experience to be positive. And so it's not just protecting wider university or protecting our athletic program, it's, it's that we want the student to do well. And then I think the other thing that went well was having the consultation with the coach. And I think people, you know, we're presenting it fairly straightforwardly here, but I just want to emphasize again, this isn't the easiest thing. You know, I've been dealing with it for many years, so I can talk about it pretty comfortably. I have friends that are transgender, it's part of my world, I have students that are transgender. Um, but for a lot of people, this is really new. And when I sat with the coaches, I really wanted to make space for them to have feelings. This wasn't necessarily something that they wanted to have to deal with. And it wasn't anything about the student. You know, they didn't have any problem with her. It was just like, oh my God, are we going to get national media attention? And am I ready for that? Or am I going to have, I mean, there was some concern actually about whether students would stay on the team. Um, so whether some of the other women on the team were not going to want to play in a team that had a transsexual male to female um, student playing on the team. And when we went in and did the meeting with all of the students, and as I said, she, she said to the students, okay, this is the time we're going to talk about this. Um, this is tonight. If you have any questions or concerns, this is the time to do it. Tomorrow we start practice. Tomorrow we're a team. That's it. And I thought she did a good job with that. Um, but as it turned out, nobody dropped off the team, even though there were some concerns. Um, but I think it was the leadership of the co-captains um, that was absolutely key. And I think they just set a tone. We're a team. 
We're going to win. <laughs> That's what we're here to do. We're going to play, and let's go. You know, and they just hoped she was good. <laughs> I don't care what she looks like. I just wanted to be a good lacrosse player. So, any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. <clears throat> well, I really don't have a question, but I really wanted to say um, thank you to you. I've had a chance to hear your presentation two times, both with the um, Division Three President's Council as well as here today. And just for me personally, having the opportunity to hear the presentation and to get the education is what I really think is going to help both us here in the national office as well as in the membership to um, begin to be more open in addressing the issue. So thank you for doing that. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All right, so my question would be, how did you handle the balance of, you said you wanted to involve the media and everything, but also the other team, but protecting the identity of the student athlete and everything like that. How did you handle that balance of getting questions and trying to stay within the confines of how to answer those questions? Actually, I don't have an answer for that because, uh, as I said, she didn't actually play. She practiced with the team, um, but in this case, because of academic reasons, she didn't play in the spring, so we didn't have, we have not yet fielded a team that has a transgender student athlete. Um, but does anybody else want to talk about that from other, do you know what George Washington did well, for instance, Mary? Sounds like that was a positive case example. Sure. Well, I think with George Washington, uh, they did a lot of preparation before uh, they went public, before Kai Allen's decided that this was the time to come out and be public about it. So I think because they did so much work, uh, Kai and the administrators did so much work together, that Kai was comfortable with publicly identifying. So I, I don't have a really good answer for if you have a student athlete that isn't comfortable with that, but I think it is all about that communication and preparation in advance, and then, and then if your uh, student athlete is comfortable, then doing it as a team, I think, is the best, best approach. Yeah. I think the other thing that maybe we should be aware of that I didn't talk about is that transitioning looks different for different people. And there's a term called passing. Um, it's easier for some people to pass than others. So, for instance, the couple that I mentioned earlier representation where he'd been taking hormones for a long time, most people in that community would never have to know that he was previously a female. He appeared male. Um, it's a little harder often for the F to F, for the male to female transition. Um, sometimes it's height and body. Um, sometimes it's voice. Um, in the particular case of the athlete that uh, we had, the lacrosse player, uh, she wasn't that tall. She was probably 5'8". Um, and she actually looked very female, but her voice was still very male. So as long as no one talked with her, <laughs> she could probably have played on that team, and no one, the parents, the spectators, you know, the media, no one would know that she had previously been male. Um, so you know, that's another whole thing. People make a decision who are transitioning whether to get a voice coach and actually work on changing the register of their voice. Um, she actually said, I like my voice, and I just don't see any reason to have to change it. And this is, again, where I think we need to respect, this is maybe goes more into the gender variance kind of way of being, that people are going to present their gender the way they're going to present their gender. And I think that, you know, in any communication, whether it's the media, whether it's to other teams, the students, it's really about respect. And it's just respect for being diverse, a uh, diverse society, and the way we look is one way that we're diverse. So, uh, you know, I think it will be interesting as, as more teams go about this. But I'm, uh, based on the case examples that we're seeing so far, I'm expecting that it'll actually go quite well. I have more questions. Just one more. Well, why don't we um, why don't we conclude our filming with a thank you to Dr. Crane for doing the session for us. Thank you.